in the 16th century, uh, uh, that was a very transitional time in Western history. The Renaissance had not yet taken a hold of European thought, but it was already raising up imaginative thinkers, and they created a climate that was receptive to new ideas. Columbus had sailed to the New World and proved that the world really was round. They didn't believe it then. Uh, the, it, uh, people who, uh, astronomers uh, have demonstrated that the sun and not the earth was now the center of the solar system. That was by Galileo and Copernicus and other people. And Erasmus and his colleagues were exploring a new interest in Greek and Roman classicism. So they were bringing philosophy back into the thinking of the Western world in a more critical way of looking at ideas. And so philosophy of science and its methodology were beginning to come into its own. And so what began as alchemy was now gener uh, becoming chemistry and research into minerals and all of those kinds of things. And, um, and that marked the beginning of the modern era. <laughs> The, the, probably the most significant um, event for the Reformation was that Gutenberg had invented the movable type printing press. And so it was now easy to set up documents very quickly, <coughs> print lots of them, and distribute them. And so all of a sudden, information was being transmitted around Europe in a way that it never had been before. And, and, and translators were, were making it available in other languages than Latin, because Latin was the language of the government and of the church. And so intellectual discourse was moving out of the academy and into the marketplace. So there was big social ferment going on. So first of all, let me talk about the status of the church in that society. Luther's Germany was part of the Holy Roman Empire. The empire was composed of all kinds of different political units. There were feudal territories, there were mercantile leagues, there were free city-states, there were remnants of the previous empires, and there was the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, in, at the end of the first century, the Church of Constantinople had separated from the Church of Rome and was no longer a part of the Western society, and it was different didn't have a pope, um, uh, so bishops were more democratic in that church. And it wasn't a mega church, it had uh, national church bodies in different countries. That's what we now know as the Orthodox Church. But the Roman Church was the only, oh, ex uh, it was an exclusive official religion of the Holy Roman Empire and it also held a lot of political power. Uh, it crowned the emperor. Um, uh, members of the church sat on the emperor's governing council uh, because some of them owned feudal territories. Some of the bishops and cardinals were feudal lords uh, in the secular realm. And the church extended its own statehood within the empire this way. And in return for the empire letting it do that, it rationalized the divine right of kings to rule. Now, uh, let's talk about the emergence of nations because the political world was also in turmoil. So the idea of a nation state like we have in Canada um, was beginning to emerge uh, because of Renaissance thinking. So it, it wasn't as established an idea as we're used to now. But Saxony, for instance, which was now part of Germany, uh, was the territory in which Martin Luther lived, and it was a member of the, 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 the prince, the Duke of Saxony, was a member of the Emperor's Council, but Saxony was still a vassal of the Roman Empire, um, not as independent even as the provinces in Canada are. Uh, the Duke governed Saxony by right of succession, uh, but he and his people pledged allegiance to the Roman Emperor and the Roman Church, and the people of Saxony paid taxes to the Duke, and the Duke paid taxes to the Empire, and Saxon troops served in the Roman army, and then in return the army maintained the laws of the Empire and defended the Empire from invasions. Uh, invading was something that started every year when the weather got good and went until it was winter. Um, 
draft uh, was rampant. It fueled the ambitions of the feudal monarchs. It enriched the coffers of both the church and the empire. Uh, but any political ambitions that threatened the unity of the empire were just mercilessly suppressed. Uh, sometimes by military force, um, or sometimes in the guise of the imposition of the church. The, the center of the empire's authority lay in southern Europe. Um, North, and northern uh, territories resented the stranglehold that, that France and Italy and Spain had on the rest of Europe. Uh, so there was an emerging nationalism and this nationalism was creating tensions. So we got emerging states beginning to evolve and nationalism along with that. And so education to Luther was part of how one became a fully formed human being under God's creation. And so Luther's curriculum for the schools included not only religious education, but also the liberal arts and mathematics, the three arts. <coughs> there was a period in Luther's life where he was under the ban of the emperor. He could be killed by anybody. Um, and so he, his duke hid, them, hid him in the castle in the Wartburg. And while he was there, then he translated the Bible into German so that it would be accessible to all the church members in Saxony and the other German-speaking uh, areas. And it was so significant that his translation resulted in a standardization of the German language in the same way that the King James Bible revolutionized English. And then Luther wrote a small catechism, and the catechism was a textbook for parents to homeschool their children in the Christian faith. Um, now it's a textbook for pastors use and people who won't homeschool anymore. Um, now let me talk about the socio-economic context. The economy in the first half of the 16th century had boomed, and so as a consequence, they, um, they, there was a huge overborrowing by the wealthy classes. And, and of course, the inevitable happened, and so the economy tanked. Um, and so that put a lot of pressure on the lower classes because Taxation was always meant to come from the bottom up. And so many of the people, uh, peasants who had leases from the nobility for a farm were losing these leases now. Uh, and so what happened is they were migrating to the cities and so they made up a huge population of starving poor. And that was the Germany that uh, Luther inherited. The clergy of that day were often undereducated and often lazy. And they were not very dedicated to the welfare of their parishes. Uh, those who had more professional skills, had some education, often used to um, uh, have second positions as a secretary to the nobility or something uh, to put a little cash in their pockets. Okay, then there was a class of people in that socioeconomic system that we now refer to as the patricians. And these were urban people. Uh, they were the city leaders. Uh, and so they were preoccupied with developing <coughs> the city and increasing the city coffers so that they could build bridges and, and do development. And so there were city taxes that they enacted. And then there were the burghers. The burghers didn't have quite the social class of the patricians, but uh, they were sort of the middle class of urban life. And these were the merchants and the artisans and the builders and the tradesmen. And so they secured and provided all the goods that were enjoyed by the wealthy. And there were the plebeians, and the plebeians were landless urban workers. And they enjoyed virtually no rights, and they survived at the whim of people who chose to employ them. So these were. Uh, you know, maids and servants and people like that who could be fired without cause and all of those things. In the rural area, there were the peasants and the serfs, and they were at the very bottom of the economic stratification. Some of the peasants held leases or tenancies from the landowners, 
but others were just sharecroppers. Uh, so they worked the land, and in return, they got a percentage of the harvest. Uh, they earned no wages except for the bed and board of the employer. Now, the burghers, the plebeians, the peasants, uh, all, these were the people who bore the weight of the taxation. And they had no accountability, no recall rights. Child labor was given. Living conditions were deplorable. People died early because of disease. They, or they literally worked themselves to an early death. Uh, uh, childbirth deaths, of both of the children and of the mothers, were a common occurrence. Human life was cheap and dispensable. And that was the 16th century. So the 16th century was right at the beginning of the modern era. Um, and the kind of things that identify the beginning of the modern era was the beginning of mass production. Uh, you know, so the, it, the Industrial Revolution is part of the modern era, and uh, a more corporate means of production, uh, science, uh, a much more public role of science, uh, invention of a lot of machines. That's all part of the modern era, and, and also the development of, of politics. So here we go. And so the modern era, although it's progressed a great deal since the 17th century, is still the era that defines reality for most of us in the Western world. Uh, at, at the same time, postmodernist thinking has been around for about a century, and I'll try to show you how that happened. And the context of the church to which we belong is still very much the context of the modern era. Is he different? No, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, our Canadian church resides in the middle of a social democracy. Not only does every citizen get to vote for representative leadership, but the elected government then is bound by a covenant to ensure certain rights and privileges to all citizens equally. <coughs> now, uh, this form of democracy is still subject to abuse and manipulation, uh, but few of us would dispute that this is a much more humane way of life than what I described of the 16th century. And inequalities still exist, but now they're generally due to individual ability to participate in the bureaucracy and the process. So here's a list of what the social covenant in Canada um, includes. So let me talk about the status of the church in the context of the social covenant. <clears throat> The church and state are separate entities in Canada, much more so even than in the United States, uh, because in the United States there's a form of civil religion that blurs the boundaries. In Canada, neither the church nor the state has the authority to direct the other, except within its own mandated sphere. So the mandate of the state is to govern property rights, the rule of law, licensing of societies and corporations. The state does not have the mandate to compel churches to enact policies that are contrary to their moral and uh, doctrinal tenets. So for example, the church, the state cannot compel churches to provide, to preside over same-sex marriages, even though the state considers that legal. But some churches don't think that that's within God's plan, so they are free and not to preside over those events. The church has a mandate to organize and register itself as a society under the um, legislation available. The church has the mandate to hold property, has a mandate to declare and teach its own beliefs, and to hold its own members accountable, so long as those teachings and tenets do not contravene civil law. See, the church cannot break the law. 
For example, the church can teach that abortion is contrary to God's will, but it cannot interfere in the right of medical clinics to perform abortions because they're legal under the law. Okay. So I'm just using that as an example. The church has a mandate to govern itself, but only within the parameters allowed by the law. So we have uh, anti-hate legislation. So churches have freedom of speech, but churches cannot promote hate of, uh, of another ethnic group or, or race and things like that, because that's against the law. The relationship between church and state in Canada, for the most part, is very symbiotic. Um, for example, properties that are used by churches for worship and teaching are exempt from certain taxes. Um, the tax exemption is not a right, it's a privilege that's traditionally been granted by the state because churches historically have provided benefits to our society. Churches have provided hospitals and schools and uh, uh, social services on a non-profit basis to meet the needs of citizens when those services were not available to them. And in return, uh, churches qualify for certain types of government funding when their, when their credentials and their criteria are equal to those of civil organizations. So for example, Canadian Lutheran World Relief um, is entitled to apply for grants from, from seed of the Canadian International Development Organization because uh, that church-related agency has the same credentials as Oxfam and Red Cross and anybody else. So um, it, it has that privilege. And other church-owned institutions like extended care health institutions and so on also apply for and are legitimate recipients of government funding. When the churches are recipients of government funding, then they can't discriminate on any of the criteria that are identified in our Canadian human rights legislation, even though in some cases those rights might contravene a particular church's moral limits. That's the relationship. Um, now let me talk a little bit about nation states. I, I think that one of the greatest inventions of the modern era was the nation state and the recognition uh, and global organization uh, of these states as sovereign territories. And then the organization that came out of all of these sovereign territories that eventually became the United Nations. Because the United Nations has established criteria for the recognition of states. And even though not all of them are dem democratic, <coughs> Uh, the recognition allows them sole custody of their affairs. So nation states become like individual landholders in a, in a global community of politics and, and economics. And some are more powerful than others, but there is no longer a single universal empire. So that's one of the major differences between the modern era and what existed in the 16th century. Now I want to go to the religious and spiritual context. The context of the church in Canada is secular. That means that the society is not religious. Uh, religion is seen popularly as something private. At the same time, our Canadian population is, is a, a multi-religious society. And Canadian citizens among them practice most of all of the world's religions somewhere. Now, an increasingly large percentage of, can, of the Canadian population uh, say on their census forms that they have no religious affiliation. But if you ask a different kind of question, even people who have no religious affiliation will still express quite a lively interest in spirituality, whatever that world, word means. So, they believe in some reality behind the reality that we sense and experience. Um, traditional religious authority in our society now is generally treated with benign skepticism. In other words, nobody would spit on me on the street because I was a bishop. But when I spoke in public forum along with other 
civic and religious leaders, my opinion didn't count for any more than anyone else, you know. So there's a kind of benign skepticism about the church, and people don't feel obliged to act on it in public life. Canada's place in the modern area was defined to a large extent by its participation in those two world wars. It was seen as a statement of national strength and character, and so Canada became internationally a desired destination for displaced persons and for refugees. And even though at, at first Canada demonstrated shameful examples of refusing people onto its land, not just uh, you know a, a Jews during the Second World War, but when a boatload of Sikhs came to the Vancouver Harbor, they were rejected. I mean, Canada was as racist as any other place. And, and French Canada even more so because it didn't want anybody but French-speaking Catholics. Um, but uh, its history since then, uh, has, uh, Canadian history has been defined by immigration. And the growth of religious membership in Canadian society has been largely correlated to the number of immigrants who came to this country. And so in the beginning, most of those immigrants were Christian. So more and more churches emerged. Uh, that has changed now. Um, and so Re Reginald Bibby says, um, even though the 50s looked like a boom in church membership, in fact, as a percentage of the population, we've been losing market share since the 1930s. So the reason the immigrants came here, partly, uh, an awful lot of them were involuntary. This is just where they happened to be able to get to. But um, Canada was seen as a place where traditional religions could still worship the god of their cultures. So you could bring your religion along with you, and you had the freedom to exercise it. You know, it's not like going to uh, a mono-religious country, either Christian or Muslim or whatever. You had the freedom to do that. What the, each immigrant group failed to recognize is that they're part of a plurality of people. And, and every group in the society is hoping for the same freedom. Uh, and so now they find themselves having to share their country. I mean, you know, when I was growing up, uh, it was the same way. And so we finally got past that. So now it's, you know, can you marry a Muslim girl? And, uh, uh, you know, we have to find elbow room for each other in this society. You know, the, the postmodern uh, movement was already underway, partly because of the way our history developed. So religion, like other cultural values, became um, a product of personal options among which people would pick and choose. So if the churches couldn't distinguish themselves from among all of these various options, then they would lose the commitment to their people. And, and, and these are people in whom they had invested all this formation. And now it's just, looked like it was just disappearing with the thin air. Um, many churches were started by people who gathered around common cultural connections. You know, so the early synods of the Lutheran Church were identified by their European origins. And so we had a Slovak synod, the Icelandic synod, the Finnish, and, you know, and all of these folks, and more than one German synod, of course, because it was a big country with uh, diversity even within the Lutheran community. So the subsequent generations of people who were born in Canada from those immigrants then were less attuned to that old country culture, and they were uh, more indifferent to uh, the social culture within those churches. And so they began to alter the scenario. And the alterations resulted in more pluralism, and, and therefore disunity. Um, every gift has its own set of curses. So after the World War II, New nations were created in, in parts of the world. Their boundaries cut through ethnic and tribal territories. Um, this happened in Eastern Europe. This happened in Africa. Um, 
you know, and, and has resulted in a century of tribal warfare. So that brings us to the boundary between the modern era and postmodernism. What the modern era did, it was such a powerful movement in our history that it totally rearranged the world, even for the pre-modern people. Um, the multicultural vision um, of uh, Canadian Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau um, it was, was a very postmodernist vision. You know, he, he broke free of his earlier nationalistic condition. He was practically a Nazi at first because that's how, how uh, the junior, uh, the Catholic junior colleges were teaching people. You know, they were very pro-France and very pro-Vichy government. And uh, so Trudeau started out as a, a nationalist, but then he went to Harvard, <laughs> you know, and his whole worldview changed. And, and so he broke free of all of that, and he was no longer defined uh, by his ethnic and religious formation. His political boundaries now were not limited by any one set of ultimate values, even though he, he was a faithful uh, Catholic believer till the day he died. And Canada will always remember this assertion, you know, the government has no business in the bedrooms of the nation. That's a postmodern statement. Critical thinking uh, was undermined by postmodernism. The postmodern world says, think whatever you want. Every idea is equal to every other idea. The world is pluralistic, it's full of all kinds of ideas. And though even many, though many ideas contradict other ideas, that doesn't mean that any idea is particularly true or false in and of itself. What is truth in a postmodern society? To say that science has, has revolutionized society beyond any other force, I think, is to state the obvious. Because, among other things, it appeals to our quest for truth because a scientific theory is not accepted as true until the results have been duplicated under the same conditions by somebody else. You have to be able to do, do it has to be able to be done twice by two different actors before you say, well, maybe that theory is true. A science has also um, advanced the progress of imagination. You know, Einstein said that imagination is more important than intelligence. Intelligence helps you do the work afterwards, but getting the idea is the thing. Uh, and so, it, you know, science uh, uh, absorbed theories of relativity, um, um, and so it began to value the kind of imagination that Einstein and others had applied to science because it could lead you to new discoveries. Uh, beyond those that once were considered to be fixed and eternal. But, you know, um, until the theory of relativity was developed, everybody believed in Newton's view of the world, which was quite mechanical, and believed that all the physical laws that we observed were <laughs> uniform over time and space. So, and Einstein came along and said, nope, space is dips and hills in it, just like our landscape. Research into neuropsychology has demonstrated that our brains are the center of who we are, not something we used to call the soul in religious language. And that what we call consciousness and personality are really generated by our brains. Uh, and among other things, our <coughs> brains contain centers for pleasure and satisfaction and happiness. And they are totally disinterested in morality or practical values self-discipline or prudence or any of those things. That's a different department. <laughs> okay, so now let me say a little bit more about socioeconomics. In some ways, the current socioeconomic system is not so different from the 16th century. We're not so postmodernists there. <clears throat> there. There are huge disparities uh, in the ratio, for example, of the wages of a CEO compared to the employees. You know, there was a kind of a CEO shouldn't earn more than 10 times what the lowest paid employee earned. Well, you know, now the ratio is 
um, 10,000 times. You know, you get employees working for $6,000 a year, and the CEO of their company is earning $6 million a year. Uh, those kinds of things. So there are these huge disparities. Uh, and also in the ratio of per capita gross domestic product. So uh, NAFTA has been very good for Mexico if you look at the gross domestic product. But if you look at who owns it, there's been a widening of the gap. Okay? So Mexico is richer only because a few people have gotten richer. Martin Luther's view of truth was not a universal opinion either. It was a truth that was believed and incorporated in his society, at least in Saxony. So it was an experience that they shared among them in this cultural and religious community. But we live in a much more fragmented community. So going back to the Gospel of John, Pilate says to Jesus, what is truth? Jesus agrees with the question because he knows what what Pilate does. And after he said this, he went to the people again and told them, I find no case against it. And yet, Jesus was crucified anyway. So, what Pilate saw in Jesus did not conform to the perception of the people who brought the charges against him. So, the question of truth was one of the key issues in the Gospel of John. <coughs> Gospel of John has several themes. It's really a theological handbook for the church after the last apostle had died. And, uh, and so it has these themes, and one of these themes is what is true. And ultimately, it is what is going to be true for our community now that we don't have an eyewitness. So, um, so the church became the authority. And could the church be trusted to tell the truth? When, an, when the trust breaks down in an institution, then individualism puts itself above society. It results in an inadequate appreciation of the nature of community and uh, discourse through which I, uh, society tests ideas you know, and seeks for truth. So in the Gospel of John, we have this metaphor of the vine and the branches. In order to be to, to say, stay connected to the source, to the source story. And Paul knew this as well. Imagine ways to live Torah righteousness that can include other people than just his Jewish community and uh, who can forgive so-called sinners and, and find a way in which there's some society of equality and peace and inclusivity. You know, we've seen that also in other areas. Uh, I told you Newton saw a very predetermined area, uh, uh, creation. Darwin saw variations in the laws. Einstein saw relativity. Even time became relative. The medical and social sciences, anthropologists uh, gave us a whole new way to look at religion and culture. Theories of brain plasticity. And so, I guess what I want to say to the church is that we should be un approaching the unfolding future with the same imagination and the same desire to seek the truth. But um, a new hierarchy of truth has emerged. And the tools of this hierarchy are actually the theori a theoretical language of mathematics and the application of very highly sophisticated technology. Um, and, and so this has resulted in a new kind of atheist class that doesn't see any kind of spirituality or transcendence in the created order all, uh, at all. Um, so the result has been that we have simply lost faith in almost everything. And um, um, we have lost uh, a lot of faith in our institutions. Do, I, do we have a slide about, there, these, are, these are all the institutions that we don't trust anymore. 
person who distrusts those institutions, there is also another person who considers them sacred. And that's the... So we have paranoia and gullibility living side by side in our society. No wonder in the medieval world, Machiavelli advised his prince, get rid of anybody who thinks for themselves. And he didn't use the word fire. Dispatch was the word. <laughs> so now you recognize that I think it is not salvation that we ought to be preaching to in the 21st century. We need to talk about the truth. But the, the other view of truth presents truth as an ongoing experience. It's almost like a, a voyage of discovery. And discovered truths lead one way, then they lead another way. Uh, along with the, the very winds that are blowing over the oceans of time. Uh, and these, this view embraces new discoveries, and it sees in new discoveries further indicators yet of what can and might be true. And so truth in this view is a hope. It's like a grand unification uh, theory of the universe, uh, which uh, modern physicists are pursuing, but nobody can define. But it's worth the chase. <laughs> you know, to see. So, how do we, the descendants of Reformation Christianity, identify our role in this relative?